We have to talk about your book because that was the thing that brought us together initially. And then I got really interested in all this other stuff that you do. Uh, so this book, bringing together the words of uh, George Carlin and James Hillman, yes, which I think is great. I love them both. I love their acerbic humor. I love their critique of society. I get a lot of catharsis from listening to them still. And I often find myself thinking, what would George or what would Jim think about what's going on in the world now like if they were this mm -hmm. kind of despondent and pissed off about what's happening in the world back in the early 2000s or late 90s what would they think now because mm -hmm. you know it's been 25 more years and things have just gotten worse mm -hmm. um but what what inspired you to put them together in this uh this book it was i don't know inspiration's the right word it was more of a um an obsession due to those guys' voices not leaving me alone okay they were bugging me a compulsion I, just, maybe not inspiration were, <laughs> yeah they i had to i had to write it down i, I was kind of going crazy because i kept hearing them clamoring and their 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 voices would mingle and argue with each other and it was it was kind of driving me nuts. So <laughs> I I just started um, writing quotes down related to words and language. Once I realized that that was the the theme that was dominant was their their views on words and language, and I just started writing everything that was um, coming to me from their books and lectures and uh, and performances, and that was. The beginning of it and uh it just continued and continued to a point where i i realized that i i had a project now <laughs> and they were kind of urging me on to to complete it hmm. and so i i dug deeper and figured out how i was gonna turn this into something and just kept working on it and took took about two years and then the fun stuff of editing and finding a publisher Took about all in s s total about six years. Hmm. Um, so now those guys, those guys' voices are quiet um, <laughs> to a, a certain extent. Uh, so really, it was it was them. They they were bugging me. You've laid the ghosts to rest by hearing them and um, following that. Yeah, they still had a lot to say. I yeah. think that was it. They just had a lot to say, and I and I needed to put them together. They those they they needed to be. I felt like they those guys needed to have a conversation together, yeah. and that's why I I did Hillman Carlin Hillman Carlin juxtaposed juxt to each other so their voices mm -hmm. could kind of clamor back and forth because that's what it felt like they just were they wanted to go at it together and they had mm -hmm. a a beef to pick with words and language and <laughs> yeah so did uh, when you were at Pacifica were you there when Hillman was still alive. No, you missed him. He, he he died in October of 2011. I started in October of 2012. Mm. Mm. It's odd. I feel like I met him, but I, I've never met him. No. I, I well, I'm sure his either. his spirit was in that place, right? Oh, like... uh, all, all over. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all over the place. Um, and I I got to be friends with. Uh, Pat Berry in Carpinteria and oh yeah um, and now uh, for people yeah. listening Pat Berry is uh one of Hillman's wives <laughs> yeah sorry second <laughs> and, second wife and a, and a, I, I think an amazing depth psychologist co-founder uh, co of Archetypal right. Psychology <clears throat> although she doesn't like to speak of it in that way but she she was there from the beginning of Archetypal Psychology and still going strong just published a book herself um and uh I also got in contact with Margo McLean uh, Hillman's third wife uh, through my book in spring. So that's been a nice mm. um, connection too. Uh, so even though I never got to meet Hillman, I, I felt like I, I uh, have. Yeah, that's great. I, I mean, I have that feeling too. And I think it's like, there, there's like, a, like, you know how Hillman talked about, you got to find out like who's on your tree. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like as you start to yeah. build your worldview uh, yeah. and like a way to like kind of focus your your reading and things like that, like mm -hmm. you got to figure out. So if you're into 
uh hillman you gotta you gotta read young because then he's on hillman's tree and, and that That's kind of right. thing right yeah but like hillman's definitely on my tree like he he speaks my language um mm -hmm. i like his fire his mm -hmm. uh, piss and vinegar <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh and also like he's been a great kind of um curator of ideas like uh he points me toward people that he references mm -hmm. and that helps to feed the, maybe the root system of my own mm -hmm. tree, you mm -hmm. know, like where did he get his ideas? And it's, uh, it's yeah. art, it's literature, yes. it's the class, uh, classical thinkers, all of that kind of is yes. feeding this tree that I happen to be on. That's right. Yeah. Same um, here. So did you get to, did you get access to the Hillman archives at Pacifica in looking for source material? Mm -hmm. oh, yep. that's a dream of mine you know mm -hmm. i, have I still fantasy... go to the campus uh checked out some dvds last week i oh, yeah I, I, I take advantage of being close to the school wow i oh. have a fantasy of uh getting a job at pacifica to help uh help them with their archive and maybe get some of it online or something just so just so i could have access <laughs> that's a good fantasy they, they they could probably use the help <laughs> well maybe i'll talk to some people but um one of the things that I'm curious about, first thing I would do if I ever got access to the archives is try to find the recording of when Hillman was on Oprah. Cause it's something wow, that I've been looking I've for that. Never been able to see it. it's listed in the archives. And I talked to Steve Eisenstadt about trying to dig it out. Yeah. Um, but I haven't, hasn't surfaced yet. And I, I need to see that. Okay. Next time I go back there, I'll see if I could I'll, uh, dig that up and uh, please record it and send it yeah i i want to see that too that's like that's got to be funny oh I, yeah he's so out of place he's so uncomfortable about that whole thing he did not like that and he wasn't you know he wasn't received well he just it's hellman on oprah he's just like nah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's why it's so funny because i want to i want to see that i know and i'm sure that's why it's never surfaced it's because you know like you can find um tom moore speaking with Oprah, but Tom is just such a kind of jovial, generous, um, like kind of soft hearted soft dude. Hello. Oh yeah. He's just, he's like, uh, hey. he's like, the, well, he's the yin to Hillman's young, you know, yeah. they're, they're like, they're soul brothers, but they're, they occupy a very kind of different, uh, different personalities completely. Yeah. yeah. So I've, you know, you can see Tom Moore on Oprah and Oprah puts that up on her site. And isn't this wonderful? We're talking about soul with Tom Moore, but this, Conversation with Hillman must have been just whole, yeah. <laughs> and he, there was um also a a conversation that he did with D Deepak Chopra. No. Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah. And I haven't seen that either, but I read I read uh, some stuff that Hillman said about that whole gathering. <laughs> I remember is Hillman was like, I was bloody bored as hell. He's like that whole, you know. <laughs> They didn't, they, they were very, uh, Hillman didn't like him and, and, uh, he, he was bored with, with the whole talk. Um, it just, it bored the crap out of him. Um, yeah, no doubt. So that, but I want to find that one too. Oh, please. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's fantastic. And then, um, you know, one of the things about Hillman and Carlin, yeah, you know, yeah, it's nice to see them in dialogue with each other. Cause you could see how they, they shared a lot of, uh, uh, same kind of views on the way society has gone and um yeah uh, and they both had like a facility with words they loved wordplay um mm -hmm. one of the things that strikes me though is both of them really had a kind of bleak outlook on the state of humanity and where mm -hmm. we're headed mm -hmm. and that's where you got the title of the book like mm -hmm. one of the last things that carlin was talking about the the analogy he was using is that our humanity is circling the drain and we're going in tighter and tighter circles like it's we're just about done yeah. and uh hillman yeah. used often relied on this analogy he'd say like we're on the titanic the ship mm -hmm. is going down mm -hmm. what do we do like mm -hmm. that's the big question what do we do? Do we look for a lifeboat? Do we try to like uh, pump out the water from, you know, all, what do we yeah. do? And I think they had kind of different responses to that. Like in, in, you know, seeing that's where things were going from their point of view. And I would agree. Um, they had a different approach to it, I think. Right. Like, can you talk a little bit about that? You know, yeah. 
The interesting thing about all that, I've been thinking about a lot of that the last few years. Um, like they weren't, they weren't nihilist and they weren't actually pessimistic either, even though Hillman calls himself a catastrophist and, you know, Carlin's talking about circling the drain. They wouldn't have done what they did. I think <clears throat> continue writing books, continue doing stand up, new material, um, interviews. They wouldn't have continued doing what they're doing if they didn't give a crap. Mm -hmm. Like, right. Somebody who's, who's just thrown up their hands and said, forget it. You, you don't continue working at that ferocious pace. And they actually, they quite the, on the contrary, they, they cared a lot about humanity. And I think they, they loved, they loved the world very much. And, um, they were probably in that, that mindset of things aren't getting better, but you still love the world anyway. And, and they, they continue doing what they're doing because they gave a crap. Mm -hmm. And even though Carlin said, you know, sometimes not giving a shit is really helpful, but he did give a shit. And, um, you know, when the World Trade Center came down, he the day before that happened, he he was doing a, a live show called um, the title of it was going to be I love it when a lot of people die or um, something like that. And they changed right. the title of it. But, you know, he was according to his daughter, he was very upset and devastated by the world trade center and everything that happened. I mean, the stuff that happened in the world deeply affected them. And, um, I, they, they did care very much. And, uh, so even though they had these images of we're circling the drain, the ship's going down, um, they continued working. And that tells me they did actually care. Um, they didn't necessarily have hope, but like they kept working at it. Mm -hmm. And so if it can kind of answer to Hillman's question, what do you do when the ship's going down? Well, in these guys' this case, you, you keep at it. You keep doing the craft. Whatever it is your your thing is, you, you keep doing it. I'll keep seeing patients till I can't see them anymore or whatever that is uh, for, for me. And um, that I think for them, they, um, despite that, those images, they, they did actually care. And so that's a kind of interesting paradox that I kind of come to. They, it wasn't um, a nihilistic yeah. thing. Yeah. Well, you know, Carlin, also, he said that, like, I root for the asteroid, you know, the big yes. asteroid to hit the Earth. Yeah. Like, he's, like, actively rooting for it. It's like, it's time for another species to get a chance. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, that we, right. didn't deserve, we, didn't, we didn't deserve, you know, to be, yeah, we, we've messed it up so bad that we don't deserve it. And, and yeah. the, But yeah, you're right, though. If he really... Of, if he had the, such a great disdain for humanity, he wouldn't have kept commenting. He wouldn't have been out there publicly. And that's so that's what I think. That's what I think too. Yeah. yeah. That's what I think too. And I think like both of them, like uh, Hillman used to call after he quit his clinical practice, he said, now I'm doing a therapy of ideas mm -hmm. and I'm, uh, and I'm putting psychotherapy through a therapeutic process and analysis. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what Carlin was doing too. Like mm -hmm. both of them were not afraid to reflect the the dark side mm -hmm. and to speak out what was what was wrong with uh, right. humanity with society in our approach to i mean they covered both just about everything both of them mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and and so that kind of role is is much needed and it's a kind of a dangerous role to put yourself in because you mm -hmm. open yourself up to then a lot of um well, critique and anger and mm -hmm. dismissal and and they and they both saw all of that right throughout their careers, That's right? right. And, and yet persisted. They, they had they had a great ability to not, not as Carlin said, not give a shit. Helmut didn't care what people thought about him really. And neither did not Carlin. give a they shit about what doing... other people think about you, but to give a shit about the state of the world. That's right. Yeah. That's right. That's right. And that's a rare combination, especially in our age of censorship. And you wonder why there's not more people like Carlin comedians speaking out at that at that level of that edge. Um, and that's know, kind of depth, you know, like and there's a depth. lot of people who do commentary. But mm -hmm. with that level of wordplay that shows that like in the roots of our language is as uh, affects a lot of our assumptions about who we are and what our place yeah. in the world is. Right. Like he went like Hillman also was an etymologist and went down to the roots of language to discover like what shapes our mind, this peculiar Western way of seeing the world that's so fucked up and has done so much mm -hmm. damage. It's like, it's there in the language. So let's do a therapy on the language. Really, 
I, I consider Carlin to be a depth psychologist. He didn't know it, but he, 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 his way of thinking is or was a depth psychologist. Um, he, he peeled layers off. He, he looked underneath things. He examined um, the surface uh, and, and he had that, that intelligence and depth um, to, to see through, uh, which is such a important part of archetypal or depth psychology. And um, he had that rare combination of, of talent of hard work and intelligence with that gift of um, putting it all together and performing it. Um, and yeah. that's a rare combination. And heart too. And heart. Because you're not going to um, listen to guys like that for too long unless you feel the love that's behind all of the kind of sardonic humor. That's right. Right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Um, and like something about their way of uh, like their methodology, like a deconstructing, ripping mm -hmm. apart, mm -hmm. all of this like gives me images of like, well, to see through, but also to kind of get down to the roots. Like you got to do that ripping apart, tearing down you know, all these deconstructionist images. Right? But by the way, I, I suspect that both those guys were metal elements. <laughs> it's so, yeah. A lot of sword yep. hacking away. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Have you ever done that? Like looked at, uh, I don't know how you do it in Chinese medicine. Like, do you look at their uh, year of birth and, and um, time of birth or anything like that to get a sense of their no. constitution? Or is it like you have to be with them to? No, no, no. Uh, you can look at their face, their their hands, their voice, um, their body posture, their movements. Um, no, it's, you could just look, you could look at somebody. Um, hmm. Hands are great the giveaway uh shape of the face um so and just style of speaking uh it's in the voice um hmm. earth elements have a sing-songy voice and da, 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 da. you know they woods are kind of punchy. woods are kind of punchy you know like little in your face waters like mine is kind of groaning flowy voice um so forth so you can you can tell pretty easily if you know what to look for hmm. i was actually going to ask you ahead here in my notes to ask you about their um kind of like from a uh, Chinese medicine point of view like what something about their constitution that informs the way they uh presented themselves or, or their method of work and so metal yeah metal incisive mm -hmm. could be kind of cold and standoffish mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. guess mm -hmm. yep mm -hmm. um what else uh prodding poking <laughs> Prodding, poking. Um, there's also an element of uh, metals are constantly dealing with the question, what's the point? For for what? <laughs> like, what's the meaning? They're very yeah. much concerned with that question as a life. Where whereas wood is, what's next? What what do I do? That's wood. Um, <clears throat> and uh, as when water, for example, is is um, related to death and fear, and uh, are thinking of um, you know ultimate questions. What what's it all come to? Yeah. Water. And water. I was um, thinking water. Why? <laughs> why? Yeah, metal and water are similar, but mm -hmm. but those guys, uh, yeah, that they they did have that kind of um, depth of of uh existential like what what is this what you know that's that's very metal and metal struggle in our world it's it's a tough constitution to be i know in a lot of metals and it's um you know why what's the point what what you know what what is going on here don't and ask perhaps that's why just is. just do is maybe our culture right yeah our culture is wood american is if you're gonna generalize it's it's a wood element um at least it's origins and values have been wood pioneers forging ahead do 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 go go that's all wood competitiveness um and uh but metals are more of an inward contractive introspective um uh, what's the point uh and are very again concerned with rules and rights and justice you know you can't do that that's not right that's not you can't do that that's that's metal you know little kids like no, 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 like you can't do that. That's not the rule. Mm -hmm. That's do the rule, follow. 
no. Carl and Hillman, of course, were very rebellious, um, but they they had a sense of justice. I think justice, yeah, justice beyond uh, societal rules and norms. Yes, yeah. like justice on a big ethical level, and yeah. they're wrestling with the, those ideas all the time. Yeah, and like Hillman uh, often spoke up for the value of the empty protest. So mm -hmm. you don't even have to have a why something mm -hmm. is wrong, but just to cry out, like, it's just wrong what we're doing to the world. And that's metal. You don't even have to like get into why, but yeah, just to point that's, out that something is wrong. There's a great injustice here. Don't ask me why it's just wrong. If you can't see that there's something wrong with you. <laughs> that's right. That's metal. That's metal right huh. there. Yeah. Interesting. Now, um, kind of conversely, maybe, um, but from the other side, like, is there a place for humor in Chinese medicine? Like, is uh, is humor a part of a diagnosis and treatment? Like, if someone comes and they haven't laughed in a year, uh, you know, could I recommend that they go see a funny movie or, you know, is like humor play a part in the treatment? It does It does with me. Yeah. Um, it wasn't an area that was covered at all in in our training program and i don't see it in any of the textbooks um modern or classical um but it's a very human thing and uh mm -hmm. for me it's it's vital i mean i humor is very tricky but i i always try to bring in some kind of humor into my sessions because if you can't laugh at the tragedies of life and, and laugh through some of the difficulties you're in trouble and i mean sometimes you just when things are so heavy and deep like if you don't have humor it, it's it's a tough go so um mm. if done with tact and and uh subtlety um i think it's almost imperative that a practitioner bring in humor every every time i mean i um <clears throat> i have a serious side but i i you, i mean i wrote a book on carlin so i, I love humor but it's it's um but the therapeutic me, value so, of humor it's such right? a given at least for me i, I mm. gosh i i don't know what i would do without it and uh thanks for bringing that up but it's just not it's not talked about in in medical school it's a it's a human thing that should just be there along with um compassion i mean it should be side by side with that uh, yeah. as far as i'm concerned uh maybe because like in chinese culture with its roots in taoism like taoism uh lao tzu it was so funny like as of now i'm getting into my 50s i'm becoming more of a taoist um mm -hmm. i'm just kind of loving it and uh you know reading about how lou reed uh, this really sardonic caustic kind of person got into Tai Chi in a, mm -hmm. in a really big way. Um, and it's kind of getting me interested in about Tai Chi too. Cause like Lou Reed was kind of a badass, and, um, and then reading, uh, you know, Tao Te Ching for the first time and like finding mm -hmm. so much humor in it, so much kind of practical down to earth wisdom mm -hmm. without, uh, without really like, I don't know, no kind of, uh, hierarchies of deities and metaphysics and all of this it's like it seems so kind of down to earth to me and there's a humor in it and i wonder if all that to say like i wonder if the humor is just a part of the way of life and so we don't have to explicitly uh talk about it as part of the the treatment or the um you know in the interaction between the patient and i would doctor. from the chinese um theory i i think it's related to the heart the heart organ and, and the fire element and which is related to joy and, and um, somebody that has a lack of humor or lack of joy, you think of a deficiency in the heart or um, something related to that. And I would, I mean, gosh, you bring up such a good point. I, I think that um, you, you could reduce it to the individual, like, well, people have different senses of humor. Some people really, funny or not funny and some people are really serious or not serious but um if there's a complete lack of of humor there's something missing going back to the lacuna the the gap there um and that's noteworthy and i would say that's related to the heart and um mm. 
loss of so hope. yeah I, there's there's been times where i've tried making jokes or tried doing funny and, and the person just is not <laughs> they're not laughing and i'm thinking gosh you know there there's some there's some depression here or some shen or heart probably you know something's is mm. there or i'm just not getting i'm just not getting their sense of humor but um yeah but well, I, from- I would say that's that's a vital part of life and gosh if you can't bring in some humor at some point uh you're in trouble yeah what uh <laughs> the way I think about it, um, or I've come to think about it is if you're able to laugh at your predicament, you've become disidentified with mm-hmm. the the suffering. So the like space. humor, uh, requires some distance, right. To be able to laugh at something, you gotta be kind of outside of it and to see it maybe in a new light. That's so right. I always say to people, if we end up like laughing together after they've just told me about some terrible thing that's going on in their life, I go, look, that's a sign of health, actually. Yes. <laughs> it's I not agree. a defense against yes. pain. It's yes. a sign of health that we've created a little bit of distance here. We can see from outside of it. And like even from a yogic perspective, I think that's a sign of of progress in separating. Um, I agree with that. Identity with. Yeah. Well said. Mm. So yeah, for me too, it's got to be there. Uh, and I think it has to do with my constitution and, and being ra- raised by people like Carlin and um, yeah. Eddie Murphy and others. Like, uh, I, you know, I would often lament, well, I didn't grow up with any kind of spiritual books in my house or any literature or anything, but we had great rock and roll records and my parents were always playing comedy records. Mm -hmm. Um, so I grew up with these guys probably hearing them like much too early, (laughs) but it, it kind of cultivated a, uh, it cultivated my funny bone. I don't know. Yeah. You know, which I'm really thankful for because it's, uh, I think it's helped keep me healthy. Me too. For sure. For sure. One of the other things I think about too, like, um, you talked about like the heart and the liver, but for me, uh, when we laugh, the diaphragm it leaps, you know, mm-hmm. the diaphragm is just mm-hmm. moving. Uh, and the other times when the diaphragm is so kind of active is when we're sobbing or mm-hmm. we're coming, we're orgasming. Mm-hmm. Um, and so if the diaphragm is frozen, yeah. we're not going to cry. We're not going to laugh. We're probably not going right. to feel a lot of uh, sexual pleasure. That's right. Uh, everything's kind of locked up. So I think whatever we can do to get the diaphragm moving again, mobile yes. is going to help everything kind of move. Cause it's a, it's the barrier between like the gut and the, the heart in a way, right. It's what's in Got between. It. Yep. Yeah. So yep. did they talk about diaphragm in Chinese medicine? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's um, it's an important zone. Some important channels go, go through there and some acupuncture points and, um, when you do qigong and tai chi um, breathing is is a fundamental component of of those exercises and diaphragmic breathing and belly breathing um so it, it is um it's it's in there i wouldn't say it's emphasized but it's it's there mm-hmm. yeah so it's another place where you know i come to this question like um one of the people i grew up with too one of my first teachers or gurus was frank zappa mm-hmm. who also shared a similar kind of uh sardonic uh caustic critical humor um as the other guys were talking about but uh he was once famously asked a question by a reporter uh because he wrote a lot of like funny songs but he was also kind of a, a serious and accomplished composer and um so they would ask him you know does humor belong in music mr zappa and he said well is it possible to laugh while having sex And I guess that's up for you to answer, but it, it'll reveal a lot about <laughs> about who you are and how seriously you take yourself, right? Well said, well said. So like well the said. question in my mind during, you know, as we're talking about these guys and about your work and um, is like, does humor belong in psychotherapy? And I think the answer is kind of the same. Yeah. <laughs> like, does it belong in life? You know? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because that's what psychotherapy is hopefully dealing with the entirety of life. Yeah. And like everything, it has its its um its time and place. And uh it's not not appropriate in every situation, but if it's lacking, uh you're you're missing something. Mm. <clears throat> well, I I've had a lot of fun talking to you. Um likewise this man. has been great. 
Now, I noticed uh, that you've got some plans to do more writing on this uh, intersection of Chinese medicine and deaf psychology. Are yeah. you working on a book or you doing articles or what's going on with that? Um, at the moment, um, no, I'm letting the ideas germinate and enjoying those those two guys off off my shoulder for, for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good. <laughs> okay. But uh, because it's not something um, I've heard explored enough or at all even. Uh, and so I want to hear more. And, and I, I, I'd i love that uh, you're bringing them together. Uh, I think we need more hands-on, embodied, physical, tangible practices to bring the depth psychology to life. Uh, it's something that mm -hmm. I'm involved in uh, mm -hmm. And I love meeting another person who's involved in that too. I think it's yeah. like the next step for, mm. for deaf psychology, mm -hmm. you know, is like bringing mm -hmm. it into the world, into um, the body uh, yeah. and, and actually having a, a treatment that can, can help with symptoms without uh, curing them away. Mm -hmm. But the, the treatment itself is helping us to go deeper into what the mm -hmm. symptom is, mm -hmm. um, leading mm -hmm. us toward you know that root system approach yeah well i think said. it's great so Thank i you. just want to encourage you to you know when the time's right start putting out some stuff and uh hopefully yeah. this conversation will kind of ignite and inspire some other people too to start that's that's talking about it more thinking about it more yeah all right yeah great well um i'm sure we'll uh be in touch down the road you got to follow up with me about the archives. If you find that uh, conversation with Oprah and Hillman, we sure. got to have a watch party or something. I'm yeah. sure we'll get a lot of laughs out of it. <laughs> Will do. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Brian. Take care. Thank you. Appreciate it, Brian.